Hey there, welcome back to my channel. I'm Cybersecurity Meg, and as always, I'm super stoked that you're here. In today's video, we're going to be going over TriHackMe's advent of Cyber 2022, day number three, which is centric and focusing on OSINT. If you're not familiar with what OSINT is, that stands for Open Source Intelligence. If you don't already have the TriHackMe task open for this day, go ahead and open it so that you can follow along with me. Let's get right into the story. As the elves are trying to recover the compromised Santa Gift.shop website, Elf Recon McRed is trying to figure out how it was compromised in the first place. Can we help him in gathering open source information against the website? I sure hope that we can. Let's try to do it. So what are our learning objectives for the day? We're going to talk about what is OSINT and what techniques we can utilize to find information online. We're going to talk about using dorks to find specific information in Google search engines. We'll discuss extracting hidden directories through the robots.txt file, how to find domain owner information through who is lookups, searching data from hacked databases, and we'll acquire sensitive information from publicly available GitHub repositories. So what is OSINT? Just to do a recap of it, it stands for Open Source Intelligence. You can feel, you can feel free to go ahead and read Try Hackney's definition of it. It's a fantastic definition. I wanted to give you a practical real life example of how OSINT is utilized. I think it'll be helpful for you. I specifically work on blue teaming doing incident response. However, OSINT can, of course, be extremely helpful for red teaming and pen testing. I know OSINT is an integral part to doing reconnaissance and any kind of pen test. However, from the blue team side of things, which is my expertise, one of the practical examples that I can give you that I've seen time and time again is OSINT being utilized when you have a spear phishing campaign targeting your organization. So let's say that you work for a specific organization and it's being targeted by a phishing campaign, right? And upon email analysis of those phishing emails, which we'll get into email analysis in a few days because I'll be teaching you guys about that on Try Hack Me Day number six, but I digress for now. Let's say that you do some basic email analysis of those phishing emails and you find the IP address of where those phishing emails are coming from. And upon looking up that IP address, you find that that IP address is owned by a legitimate business. So you think to yourself, hmm, why is a legitimate business that has good intentions, is well known, sending out phishing emails to my organization? Well, more than likely what happens is that there's a server compromise within that legitimate business and legitimate business is unknowingly having that compromised server being utilized to send out phishing emails. So a practical usage of OSET in this case would be me going to who is lookup and looking at who owns that IP address, that domain that's being spoofed to send out phishing emails and discerning who is the registrar for all of this environment. So looking on who is lookup is going to tell me who owns the domain, who is the contact point, the name of the person, their phone number, their email address. And because that information is provided in an open source manner, I can then reach out to the owner of that server and say, hey, Mm, I, it's being used, uh, you know, a server within your environment to send out phishing emails. And I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but I wanted to let you know. So because of that open source intelligence being provided online, it would be helpful to me as a blue teamer. Now, that's just my side of things from the blue team perspective. Of course, there's a thousand more reasons and actually a thousand malicious reasons of how OSINT can be utilized. For instance, an attacker could also use that information that's publicly available to purport to be that domain registrar to try to actually fish them, to spear fish them or anything of the sort. So you always have to think of information being publicly available as a twofold. It can be fantastic for one person, such as myself, who has legitimate business intentions that are helpful, or it can be awful if you're an attacker who has the wrong information that you shouldn't be having. So let's talk a little bit about OSINT techniques, Google Dorks, for instance. What is Google Dorks? You may not have heard of it. Google Dorks is the ability to use advanced queries to search Google that returns information that's not usually readily available through basic queries. If you want, I would advise going through the queries that TryHackMe provides right here and getting some practice in using them. The one that I think is the most interesting is this one right here. And it says, for example, you can use the dork site, github.com, quote db underscore password or db is database to search only in github.com and look for the string database password, which is possible database credentials. You might be thinking to yourself, well, Meg, why would anyone be sharing their database, database credentials on GitHub so easily? 
unfortunately, it just happens so often where an organization doesn't have the right quality control or security security controls in place that they think that they have their source code and their GitHub repos being on private so that only certain people within their organization or third parties can access the source code. Unfortunately, it's very common that these get left on public or there's some kind of misconfiguration. And, you know, if you're familiar with the OWASP top 10, misconfiguration is one of the biggest, it's one of the top 10 repeatedly year after year. And it's because of things like this, where organizations forget to properly configure their security settings, and the attacker comes along scraping through GitHub repos and finds database credentials, which gives them much easier access than if they actually had to like brute force their way into it, because they already have the password. Who is lookup? We already spoke a little bit about this when I provided my real life example of it. However, just to kind of recap on it, a who is lookup is a database that stores public information such as registrant, the domain owner, administrative billing and technical contacts in a centralized database. It's publicly available so that me or anyone working in any kind of organization can go and discern who owns this domain, who can I contact if I have an issue with it. Again, this can be used for nefarious purposes. So oftentimes who is lookups require having an account or it could be behind the paywall for who is lookups that utilize uh, or provide a lot of in-depth and granular information. Uh, TriHackMe provides a link to who is lookup. However, that's not the only who is lookup that exists. There's tens, if not hundreds of thousands of different databases like these, and they all have various settings of how you can access information. Some are behind paywalls because they provide more granular and detailed information. Some of them are completely free. So it just depends on what one you're looking at. Robots.txt is a publicly accessible file created by the website admin and intended for search engines to allow or disallow indexing of the website's URLs. Why is this important? Because this tells us what information can perhaps a bot go and scrape and what information can they not. So the example that TriHackMe gives is it's a kind of communication mechanism between websites and search engine crawlers. Since the file is publicly accessible, it doesn't mean anyone can edit or modify it. Only you know, the domain register that website owner can. You can access robots.txt by simply appending the robots.txt at the end of the website URL. You can see that right here in the example that they give, it's just google.com backslash robots.txt. So we can see that Google has allowed and disallowed specific URLs for web scrapers and search engines. It'll tell you right here, disallow or allow for what is available to be scraped. This disallow parameter helps bad actors to identify sensitive directories that can be manually accessed and exploited, like the admin panel, logs folder, et cetera. So why is this important for attackers? The things that are disallowed, they're gonna be disallowed to the general public for reasons, whether it's because it contains uh, you know, sensitive information, if there's PII in it, if there's proprietary data, some kind of imperative source code that shouldn't be leaked. It, event it essentially gives the attacker an idea of where is that information located? Breach database search. I'm pretty sure that you've heard about this one, but Have I Been Pond is one of the most notoriously infamous databases where you can go and look at uh, one of my email addresses, for instance, that I used to use. Let's say it was Megan dot I love dogs six two three at gmail.com. You can go and type in that specific email address and it's going to tell you have you been pwned or not, right? So that's really useful as an open source intelligence technique. The bad thing about it is that if you're going through and utilizing this and you discern that your email address has been pwned and that the uh, password has been compromised. Oftentimes people are using that same exact password across multiple different websites. So that lets the attacker know like, hmm, this email address has been compromised, the password to it at least. And if that password has been compromised, let me go and see where else that person who's been compromised has been utilizing that password. Usually someone's using the same password for their bank, for Netflix, for social media, for various different things. So no boy knows we like to say. Major social media and tech giants have suffered data breaches in the past. We're aware of that. 
As a result, the leaked data is publicly available. Most of the time it contains PII like usernames, email addresses, mobile numbers, and even passwords. Users may use the same passwords across all the websites. That enables bad actors to reuse the same password against a user on a different platform for a complete account takeover. Many web services offer to check if your email address or phone number is in a leaked database. Have I been pwned is one of the free services. One thing that I'll tell you about from my professional experience is a lot of large organizations, typically Fortune 500 companies or small to medium businesses, they are utilizing um, threat intelligence sources that are going to let them know when their colleagues' data has been leaked. So oftentimes what that looks like, there are some tools that to the top of my mind are like Recorded Future and various other platforms like this, they will set up alerts for your organization's domain and it'll give you an alert to the Security Operations Center of the SOC and it'll say, you've had 10 colleagues in the last week whose email addresses have landed up on the dark web. And then a lot of organizations in response to that have a documented process and procedure that will have uh, the security operations center, cybersecurity personnel reach out to the compromised users and say, hey, we have a security tool that found your email address compromised on the dark web. We need you to reset your password and take these security measures so that doesn't happen again. Searching GitHub repos. If you're not familiar with it, GitHub is a renowned platform that allows developers to host their code through version control. I'm sure you've heard of, heard of it at this point, especially if you're here working on Advent of Cyber. Um, a developer can create multiple repos and set the privacy setting as well. A common flaw by developers is that the privacy of the repo is set as public, which means anyone can access it. That could be passwords, access tokens, anything of the sort. So no bueno again. Let's go ahead and get into some of the questions. Mick read the recon master, search various terms on GitHub to find something useful, like Santa gift shop, Santa gift, Santa shop, etc. Luckily, one of the terms worked and he found the website's complete source code publicly available through OSINT. What is the name of the registrar for the domain santagift.shop? So let's think back to access or discern who the name of the registrar is for domains, we wanna to go to who is lookups. So I've already gone to who is lookup. If you're in need of the link to get there, you can just go up here where they provide the free website. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we will search for that specific one. Go ahead and look at santagift.shop. And if we scroll down here, like I mentioned earlier, it gives us all of the registrar information who the name of the registrar is, the server that's hosting it, the status, it tells us when the certificates expire, all the servers, et cetera. But most importantly right now, the specific question is asking for the name. And we can see that the name is Namecheap Incorporated. Yay, we got it right. Find the website source code repo on github.com and open the file containing sensitive credentials. Can you find the flag? So I already have GitHub open. And the easiest way to do this, if you don't have a GitHub account, that's perfectly fine. You don't need to create one to complete this exercise. What you'll do within the attack box is you'll come over here and you'll do search GitHub. You're going to put in the name santagift.shop and search all of GitHub. And that returns the source code that we're looking for for this specific exercise. So let's go ahead and open that up. Now it says, find the website source code repo on GitHub, which we've done and open the file containing sensitive credentials. Can you find the flag? So what we'll go ahead and do is view the code. And actually, let me go back really quick because it'll tell us down here at the bottom. It says, this repository contains source code for production and the QA website of santagift.shop. Only legitimate members and developers are allowed to access the website and make changes files. The config.php file contains the credentials for database connection and must be handled with care. So that tells us we need to go to the config.php file. So we'll go back up and view the code. Then we're going to go to the config.php file and open the file containing since credentials. Can you find the flag? Oh, look, here we have a flag. <laughs> so let's go ahead and copy that. All right. 
Yay, we got another answer craft. What is the name of the file containing passwords? Well, we already know that. That is config.php. So that's quite an easy one. It tells us the file name right here. What is the name of the QA server associated with the website? So the QA server, let's see. Fraud. Nope. Let's go back. And let's go back one more time. Let's go to the original and scroll down. And I believe it told us at the very beginning, it said qa.sampgift.shop. Okay, we got that one right too. What is a database password that is being reused between the QA and prod environments? So the easiest way to do this, what we're gonna do is go up to the top in GitHub. We're going to search for the term password. And we wanna make sure that we're setting the search parameters to in this repository so that it's only searching the specific repository. Now, what we'll do is scroll down. You can see that it's highlighted the passwords. But these aren't the passwords that we want. We're looking for db underscore password. If we look here, we see that we found database underscore password. So we'll scroll down a little bit. And if we do a little bit of basic code review, what we'll see here is that it's saying if the environment is in QA, then use this password that's on line 31. And we know that this is QA. If we scroll down a little bit, then we're gonna see, again, it says if the environment is production, then utilize this password that's here on line 55. So it's telling us that the password for both production and QA is Santa 2022. All right, so if you wanna check out this room, it provides a link below. You'd like to learn more about Google dorking. I think it'd be a really great opportunity for you. That is it for our OSINT task of cyber day number three. I hope that you guys enjoyed this review. I'll be doing another video about email analysis on day number six. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments below and I'll help you out as quickly as I can. Have a great day, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and I'll see you soon. Ciao.